Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me in another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I appreciate you spending your most valuable resource, your time once again with me for another episode. All of our past episodes, along with our community resources, can be accessed at CashflowNinja.com. That's CashflowNinja.com. You can also access a link to my other uh, podcast, Cashflow Investing Secrets, where I share ideas, uh, concepts, and lessons learned from interviewing over 600 Cashflow Ninjas on the Cashflow Ninja Show, and also what I've learned studying um, ultra-wealthy individuals for over two decades. Um, I want to invite you guys to a webinar presentation that my friend Dave Stetch and myself will be hosting on September 1st at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and this will be done live. And I want to share with you why this is such a fantastic opportunity uh, to learn from Dave. Now, Dave is a multimillionaire, lives in Puerto Rico, very, very successful guy. And one of the things that I've learned from Dave is, and also wealthy folks in general, is that you're only as good as the information and data you have access to. That sometimes is the, 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 the difference between the majority of people and the 0.01%, right? Is the access to the accurate information and data. Um, because you're only as... The, the, the decisions and um, that you make and in... Uh, the the strategies that you employ, it's only as good as the data that it's based on. And uh, Dave and his family office, they spend a very high six-figure number every single year um, just investing and in getting the best data possible. And that's why he's been so accurate. I mean, he literally has a crystal ball. He's four for four, um, and he's lost four calls. Um, and He's, one of the calls was actually, uh, he made this during a presentation he did at Harvard, uh, and this is in 2005. He predicted that in 2007, the real estate market would crash. He also then predicted that in 2008, Las Vegas would be the number one market to buy real estate in, uh, in 2008, which it was. Then again, he predicted in 2011 that in 2012, real estate prices would begin to sour again, which they did. And then last year, after a presentation, I had dinner with him. And during this presentation and during our conversation at dinner, he said, 2020 is it. My data tells me a recession is coming. Uh, and this was before COVID-19. And by the way, uh, as I think a lot of folks are starting to realize now, too, the pandemic has been a cover for a lot of things and a lot of inefficiencies in many areas globally. The financial system uh, and the, eco the economies is one of them. And the reason why I'm saying that is in September of last year, uh, we saw shenanigans on the repo market with the Federal Reserve basically had to step in and bail um, perform a bailout of the financial system. And then in December and January, we had the biggest resignation of CEOs, I believe, in close to the, potentially in the country's history. Name the big corporations and their CEOs resigned. They saw what was coming. Again, these folks have access to the data, the, the data that Dave has, has access to. And he's going to share what he sees coming in the real estate market. Um, what, what's next and what you can do about it and you can, uh, what, you, what you need to avoid coming down the line and or how you can capitalize on it. And you can register for this webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash so to. That's cashflowninja.com forward slash so to. S-O-T-U, State of the Union, cashflowninja.com forward slash S-O-T-U. It's live. It's a live webinar 
September 1st, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that you get to enjoy the presentation, get access to this data, and you get to ask him questions live. You don't want to miss this. You know, we usually don't have uh, access to people uh, of, of Dave's caliber with his information and, 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 and the data that he has and the uh, the just the, the success that he has accomplished and achieved. So I would just really encourage you to sign up for this and join us. I'm going to be learning a lot. I've learned a lot. Every single time I've interacted with him, uh, I've learned quite a bit. So uh, I'm looking forward to you joining us. There's cashroninja.com forward slash so to. Today's episode, I want to talk about uh, the World Health Organization came out and they said basically that we have to, it's going to take five years, five years for uh, to get the COVID-19 uh, virus under control. Five years. And I've got to say, when that came out, I, at first I was like, you got to be kidding me. Um, and I'm pulling up an article here now as we speak. Um, World Health Organization warns it could take up to five years before the coronavirus pandemic is under control. This is CNBC. Uh, yeah, and that basically that message is now everywhere. A lot of folks are now coming out and I've also got some friends that have shared that they're, the CEOs and their companies are preparing basically for five years of this, of uncertainty, of spikes, of stop, start, stop, start. Um, and uh, I mean, you can imagine what the world would look like if we have another five years of this, right? And that's why I felt I just wanted to grab a microphone, press record, uh, turn on the camera and just talk a little bit about this because this is a pretty big deal. Um, now. One of the things that I've shared on a previous episode is there was a report released in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this report, the first editorial was published on February 28th, 2020. And then there were adjustments made um, uh, and updates made on March 26. So this is, it, this was literally around about the time when all this stuff started happening, right? Um, and the reason why this is important and why I find this important is that one of the authors here of this editorial was Anthony S. Fauci. And uh, the title, you can look it up, go to your browser, put it in, type in New England Journal of Medicine. The heading is COVID-19 Navigating the Uncharted. And the reason why this is interesting is there's actually a paragraph here um, and I'm going to read from it for you. It says, on the basis of case definition requiring a diagnosis of pneumonia, the currently reported case fatality rate is approximately 2%. In another article in the journal, Quan uh, et al. report mortality of 1.4% among um, 1,099 uh, 1 patients, rather, with laboratory. I'm going to redo that. I'm going to reread this. On the basis of case definition requiring a diagnosis of pneumonia, the currently reported case fatality rate is approximately 2%. In another article in the journal, Guan et al. report mortality of 1.4% among 1,099 patients with laboratory confirmed COVID-19. These patients had a wide spectrum of disease severity. If one assumes that the number of asymptomatic or minimally uh, symptomatic cases is several times as high as the number of reported cases, the case fatality rate may be considerably less than 1%. We are living through unprecedented times, and many experts say that in the coming months and years, we're about to see some of the best real estate opportunities of our lifetime. Who's going to benefit the most from these opportunities? Those with access to capital, which is where the Real Estate Accelerator comes in. Brought to you by Good Egg Investments, the Real Estate Accelerator is an online course and mastermind that will give you everything you need to raise private capital for real estate syndications. Through building a killer brand that attracts the right investors, you'll be able to take advantage of the upcoming opportunities and scale your business. To learn more, check out cashflowninja.com forward slash good egg. This suggests 
that the overall clinical consequences of COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to those of a severe seasonal influenza, which is a case fatality rate of approximately 0.1%, or pandemic influenza, similar to those in 1957 and 1968, rather than a disease similar to SARS or MERS, which have had case fatality rates of 9 to 10% and 36%, respectively. So, it may be less considerably, is the word less than, than 1%. They knew this already in March. So, why the lockdowns, the shutdowns, shutting down the economies? Um, if you think about it, the folks that, that, have been, uh, that have been hit the hardest by this are people that are older, people with pre-existing conditions, and people that are unhealthy, uh, obesity, uh, and so forth. So, they've shut down still. The, the world was shut down. None of the numbers, none of it that was shared came to fruition. They scared us all uh, <laughs> they scared us all into our, the, the basements of our homes, basically, with huge numbers. Millions of people are going to die. Um, the, you know, hospitals are going to be filled up. I mean, we saw uh, things in the media of people falling over in, 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 in China and so forth. So um, we were very, very, very much, there was a lot of fear mongering. Um, and people at that stage said, you know, they will... They will shut down, they will self-quarantine, if you will, um, basically stay in their homes and do that until this passed. Well, we know how long it dragged on for, and now uh, we're now literally almost in September, and most of the economy is still not fully functional and open. Most businesses have not gone back to the way that they were, and we have restaurants that are not at capacity, business are not operating at capacity, and this is disastrous, disastrous effects on the economy. The impact on human life that this will have, uh, whether it's the psychological impact, uh, mental, mental health impact, is going to be much, much worse than the impact that the virus itself had. I could see the fatality uh, rate being much, much higher, the death rate being much higher, just from the psychological effects, from the, um, the mental health issues, suicides. We could go on. We could, we could pull up numbers uh, on it when, this, when, when the dust settled, and you'll see that this was much more damaging to people um, uh, than, than basically what, what this virus has been. Um, in a, in a free society, this was, by the way, number one, the first, the first time that we've quarantined healthy people. It was usually the sick and the people that, that would be in danger of getting severe um, symptoms uh, from the virus that would be quarantined or would be kept out of harm's way, which in a free society, people would keep their businesses open. People that would assume the rest to go outside would be welcome to go into their businesses and continue to conduct businesses and assume the risk for it, the folks that are would be exposed to this and in danger would self-quarantine at that stage, you know, the, the older people and the people with pre-existing conditions. So there's something else at play here. Um, and I think it comes down to, uh, to power. I think the power that the governments, whether it's federal, national, lo and local, have over people and, and businesses in general now is uh, to such an extent that no one's willing to go to give up power uh, like this. If you think about it, um, you know, we have even been bombarded with the language of the new normal. There's no such thing, folks. It's either normal or abnormal, and it's very, very abnormal. Um, and I think that's what it, what's at the core here is power, because if you think about it, governments have completely controlled the movement of people with a threat of a virus with uh, a very, very, very low death rate, more uh, to, to just quote the report from the New Eng England uh, Journal of Medicine, more, uh, to be more akin of the... Uh, of, of, of the flu, of the seasonal influenza. Um, 
So I think I think that's the thing is I think it's uh, it's power. It all comes down to, to power. Uh, they've totally controlled the movement of people. People are now restricted to traveling, whether it be overseas. Overseas flights have been canceled. I think um, was it Qantas just came out in Australia with an article that they've suspended uh, any international flights till next year in July. Um, it has completely controlled the movement of people. And in the United States, when you travel from certain states to other states, you have to swap self quarantine. Um, so every country is different, every continent is different, but essentially it's come down to control over the movement of people, which is kind of, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of power to have over people and then control over businesses. Because if you think about it, governments, whether it be federal or national or local, they get to decide who stays open and who stays closed. Um, who is, are essential businesses or essential workers um, and who are not. And by the way, I, I do not like that, um, that terminology at all, folks. Um, every person's job is essential to that person and that person's family to take care of themselves and their family and for their survival. So every job is essential. There's no, you know, uh, we, we, we get bombarded about with language about how we're all, um, you know, all, all of us are, um, you know, all of us are equal and equal rights and so forth. So you cannot at that stage say that the one person's, uh, the one person's uh, employment is more essential than the other one. You know, yes, we have frontline workers. Yes, they are absolute heroes. They take care of people. They are selfless. But I don't like that phrase because essentially every person needs to be able to take care of themselves and their family. And governments, whether it be federal or whether it be national or whether it be local, are now deciding who gets to do that and who does not. Uh, and that's a lot of power. Um, I'll give you an example. So somebody re remarked to me and said, MC, I know something was wrong when I couldn't go to my local florist to buy flowers and support the local business of my community, but I can get on my car and drive to Walmart and buy flowers at Walmart. That's when I knew when something was, was, was not right. Something was off. So a lot of power. And if you see the people uh, that are benefiting from this, the fangs are... Uh, notorious now. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and then you can add Microsoft to that, Walmart. Um, these are all big, big corporations, and big corporations also have access to cheap capital, which small businesses just do not at the moment. So, um, you know, you look at small businesses and, and look at restaurants in particular. You know, they're only at 25% basically of, 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 of capacity. How do you survive and how do you survive for another five years if you can only operate at 25%? You're not. You're not going to. Um, so it looks like the power that whether it's federal or national or local governments have is the power of basically picking again in a much, much different way, but like the loss crisis, who are winners and who are losers? Who gets to get bailed out and who uh, gets to not get bailed out and who goes under? In this case, it's who gets to conduct business and uh, who does not. Um, so the result of this is that we're going to see a ton of business closures. The numbers are already skyrocketing. It changes week to week. Um, the bankruptcies already, corporate bankruptcies are soaring uh, globally. Um, this has led to unemployment that those numbers are even doctored. One of the sources that, that I have is Shadow Stats. I, John Williams, on the show. If you go to cashflowlinge.com forward slash um, uh, John Williams or just search for John Williams, rather, um, you'll find the episode that I did with him. Uh, and uh, he's got a, a website, I'm a subscriber of Shadow Stats, and that's actually um, how they, he still uses the same mythology of how they calculated uh, unemployment, for example, before all the shenanigans 
uh, started so in the uh, in the 80s, and the numbers that he's looking at right now is 30 percent unemployment in the United States. Um, we are go which it, it, it's quite incredible. We've essentially established universal basic income, which was something that a lot of people were opposed to. We've essentially established that now, and it's become part now as checks have been mailed out to people, and um, there's been checks on top of of unemployment. At, so that I, I think that's going to become permanent too. So that's going to be a result of this. I don't think that the government's going to step back. Every program that is enacted and that is rolled out is never rolled back. Um, it just increases and is expanded upon. So I think um, universal basic income, that's going to be a, a, a permanent feature from this, this crisis. Uh, for individuals, we'll see uh, you know a lot of folks are behind on rent and mortgages currently. Those numbers vary every week as well. Um, but there's a lot of folks behind on rent and, and, and on mortgages. Um, you know, when when banks and financial institutions and corporations have problems, it leads to economic problems, which results in bailouts for them, um, like it has. Um, read G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. The name of the game is bailouts. Um, and when the poor and the middle class have problems um, and a crisis... That's going to lead to political problems and a lot of social unrest, and it coincides with uh, a, an election year, 2020, in the United States. We've already seen a lot of social unrest, and essentially, globally, wherever you live, um, fo I mean, we've all lived in, in a pressure cooker, essentially, culturally, um, demographically, uh, as, a, as a society. And... Um, that's really, really starting to uh, to reach uh, peak, uh, peak, peak cooking temperature um, globally. Because you're starting to see a lot of demonstrations, a lot of uh, protests, uh, not just in the United States, all over the world. Um, as far as in society, too, I mean, what we're looking at right now in your community and in your neighborhoods. There are some schools that are opening, some are not opening fully, some are opening virtually with the goal of eventually having people go uh, back to school. Um, people are still working remotely. Most people have not gone back to their corporate offices. A lot of pe uh, companies in the space that I operate in, the insurance space, uh, they're going back next year in Q2 they're shooting for, of getting people back into the corporate offices. Um, so people have essentially been isolated. We've, we've essentially been isolated as humans in our homes, working from our homes. We've had maybe both working parents at home with the children at home as well, um, which has been challenging for a lot of folks. Um, and... Um, People have been, uh, like I said, I isolated and become suspicious of one another. Um, there's a so certain, uh, I would say, amount of distrust now in society. We have been divided now more than any other time in my life. Um, but now there's also that distrust factor of, of it too. But, you know, we we see the mask, no mask arguments. We see, um, you know, the everybody's turned into a medical expert when it comes to cures and treatments and, and so forth online. Social media has been ablazed with people. Camaplan is one of the leaders for personalized tax deferred and tax free IRA planning. Camaplan's team can assist you to take control of your retirement funds and financial future through self-directed investing. They offer support to clients throughout the entire process, from opening your first account, to making your first purchase, to self-managing your assets. Camaplan works with a growing network of investment providers in all asset categories and offer free investor education through classes, events, and webinars with over 15 years of leadership and self-directed retirement investing. Camaplan will help you unlock a convenient and safe way to manage your retirement investments and discover financial freedom beyond traditional investments, beyond Wall Street, and go from forever taxed 
to never tax. Start to take control over your retirement funds and financial future today by visiting cashflowninja.com forward slash camera plan. Arguing, um, family families have been split up. Um, it, it's 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 been uh, yeah it's it's been a very very a time where a lot of folks are divisive. Um, so this is this is where it's at right now, and if this is this continues for the next five years, we're gonna we're gonna see a much 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 different world. I think there's going to be a breaking point for many people, for many businesses. Uh, if this continues to go on for another five years, which is the, what the World Health Organization uh, said, and now other organizations are starting to, to say the same thing. So um, the goal of this is to share a couple of, uh, of things to anticipate and prepare. And then I'll, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we can prepare for this um, and position ourselves, our families, our business, businesses to be on the right side of this because there's obviously a lot of societal chaos right now. It's incredibly chaotic. Uh, economy, financial systems, businesses, uh, in the home, in communities, it's election year. I mean, you throw something on this. Uh, if you can throw something else on this, please let me know. But we, there, there's also a silver lining. There's also, amidst all of this chaos, times, uh, well, this opportunities to position yourself to be on the right side of the greatest wealth transfer in human history that I think um, we're in the, in the process of. So things to anticipate, to prepare and to protect yourself and your family and your business is the second wave phenomenon, the, we've heard the term second wave, second wave, second wave. The second wave most likely in the United States is on the way. Um, and this will, this will be rolled out during, I guess, the, the, the flu season, right? So be prepared for a potential future lockdowns. And what I mean by that is there might be, there might be a, a second a second lockdown where everything is being locked down again. Um, so have enough food on hand, have everything you need to survive already because you do not want to be the lost person uh, or one of the people jumping in a car and running to the stores like what happened earlier this year when there's a second lockdown announced or people are preparing for it or people are now running on grocery stores, you know, um, trying to stock up on toilet paper again. So you want to have all of those things on hand um, to take care of yourself and your family and your loved ones. So prepare now for that because it's a possibility. Most likely it's not going to happen, but it's a possibility. Um, be also pre be prepared for potential continuing civil unrest during the election time or after the elections in the United States. So you want to be prepared for that and you want to make sure that you are, have everything that you need to protect yourself and your family. It's different for everyone. Take care of yourself and make sure you, you have everything in place um, and you have everything that what you need. Um, let's talk a little bit about real estate because we covered a lot of the societal stuff, uh, what's going on. We've covered how to protect um, your family uh, for potential second lockdown and also the civil unrest. Let's talk about real estate. There's obviously been a massive spike in prices, <laughs> home prices in certain markets in the United States because of certain trends and certain variables. You know, people are obviously um, seeing that the world is changing, how we are going to work in the future is going to change. So um, people are seeing that they might be working virtually forever. Um, so this basically impacts where they're going to live. They don't have to live close to where they used to work. And if you lived in a, in a city with a lot of people, then they're trying to get out of there. Um, and obviously there's a lot of folks moving from cities uh, to suburbs and to more rural areas and the countryside. So people are rushing out of major cities, um, buying houses, sight unseen, 
over online making offers. There's um, certain markets where houses are listed and people are outbidding each other uh, for those. So there's been a great spike. Uh, interest rates are low. What, what has also happened is that a lot of folks that would normally sell their houses are not in a position to sell their houses because of uh, just the, some of the financial stress that they're enduring currently. Uh, maybe they've lost a job, uh, maybe they're unemployed, maybe they've been furloughed, maybe they have made a lot less money this year than what they did in previous years. So they're not quite in the they're not quite in the position to sell the house that they're in, which they would normally do, to buy another house. So the inventory has shrunk, uh, the money's cheap, and people are trying to <laughs> trying to get into uh, get get out of the big cities and get into those markets so supply and demand and that's why house prices are spiking there so that's one of the trends that that we're seeing um, and that's in certain single family markets obviously things are quite different in multifamily um, you know so it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, there still a lot of opportunities potentially moving forward uh, mobile home park self storage Resorts, hospitality has been hit very, very hard. One in four hotels are behind on their mortgages. So you have 25% of um, mortgages on hotels are behind. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunities to pick stuff up there. We've had my partner Josh McCallan from Accountable Equity on the show talking about his vision and what he's trying to accomplish. And this is one of the uh, you know one one of the times where there's going to be massive opportunities to pick up historic trophy properties close to big markets to implement and execute uh, the business plan that he has already done successfully at one of the properties uh, that we're invested in at Renault. What's going to happen in assisted living facilities? What's going to happen to commercial real estate? Uh, we've got a ton of office space that's going to be empty. We've got a ton of stores that are closing up. Um, you know, we've already seen Amazon uh, expressing interest in in that and purchasing that. So that's going to be interesting to see what, what's happened there. So we'll continue to monitor what's happening in the trends in real estate. Um, you know, we see a lot of renters being behind on their rent and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, homeowners being behind of mortgages, and this is going to lead to a lot of defaults, um, I believe, in the coming months, 12 to 18 months. Um, financial reset. There's a sea of debt at the moment. Countries are printing. I don't, they're not even printing. They're just digitally adding and creating endless amounts of money. Um, I mean, there's an article, literally, friends, there's an article, if this doesn't really uh, get you a little bit nervous of what's going on, I don't know what would, but there's an article on Forbes uh, where it's projected that the national debt in the United States would be $78 trillion by 2028. $78 trillion by 2028. Um that's going to have massive, massive, massive um, effects and ramifications, folks. Um, so we've got a lot of countries already expressing interest in a digital currency. China has already looked at a potential digital currency, a sort of a crypto uh, Chinese uh, government currency. Uh, it's actually included in the CARES Act as well in the United States. Uh, so... That's going to be on the cards for the U.S. as well, its own digital uh, sort of currency. Um, money will go digital. And one of the things that we also saw in the United States is there currently is a coin shortage, if you can uh, believe that. Um, interesting how this all kind of lines up. Um, and a lot of places that I've been to lately has uh, in the windows um, a sign that they don't accept 50 or $100 notes anymore. So you can see slowly but surely money is being worked out of the system. There's a quote-unquote coin shortage in the United States. And in the CARES Act, there's already provisions in there in the United States for a digital currency. So that's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, digital wallets will be a thing in the future, I believe. Um, and, um, 
you know, there's already a lot of things happening just in the crypto space that's been very, very interesting. I did a, a podcast actually on it on my other podcast, Cashflow Investing Secrets, where crypto might have had its Netscape moment. Uh, everybody remembers that, how uh, hard it was to navigate the internet. Uh, when it first came out, you had dial up internet, and then it was very hard to get online, number one, and number two. Uh, and number two, it was very hard to browse it until Netscape Communicator came about, the web browser, which made it much, much more user friendly. And the uh, adoption rate for people surfing the Internet soared after that. Uh, what just happened with cryptocurrency is that banks, through the regulatory um, agency in the United States, the Office of Con Controller of Currency, um, Banks are allowed to be the custodian for cryptocurrencies, which means banks can hold cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, on behalf of their clients, which is going to definitely have an impact on the adoption rate. It's going to be much, much easier for folks to get into crypto and Bitcoin. Um, so we could see a this just being one of those Netscape moments, which just makes it much easier for people to get into it. We've seen earlier this year um, legendary traders such as Paul Tudor Jones get into Bitcoin for the reason of an inflation hedge because there's only a limited supply of it. And we see governments across the world just creating and creating currency. So it's very much something that um, uh, that that we've looked at. And there's a lot of other uh, well-known investors now getting into it. Um, so there's... There's a lot happening in the cryptocurrency space. Um, and then also, as far as the commodities, we've seen one of the biggest moves uh, <laughs> of note, where one of the biggest critics of gold, Warren Buffett, purchased a massive, massive stake in Barrick Gold. Um, it's a company. So there's, a, there, there's some interesting things happening on the crypto side and also on the commodity side. So Buffett has purchased a gold company um, and is now invested in, in that space and a company in the gold space, which he's been a massive cri critic of it. So he's also in a lot of cash. So Buffett is holding a lot of cash through Berkshire Hathaway and also invested in a, in, a, in a gold company. And then we've got other legendary traders, as I mentioned, Paul Tudor Jones, which put, I believe, 2% of his net worth into Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency. So you could see that folks are starting to make some move. And uh, one of the things that I like to do is just watch what these big investors are doing, not just what they're saying, because what they say and do are two completely different things for most, most of the time. So it looks like cash, some crypto and some gold, the three types of money, as Robert Kiyosaki calls it, calls um, gold and silver God's money. He calls um, fiat currencies that are created by government decree and enforced by legal tender laws. He calls that government money. And then he calls cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum people's money because money was, uh, was well, money came from people like you and me in the market. It wasn't invented by governments. The market always decided what money was, and it looks like the market is is speaking very loudly for crypto. Again, still very, very small. Um, please do your own research um, before getting uh, into any cryptocurrencies and never, ever invest in anything that you don't understand. Um, so those are just some thoughts on, on the financial reset and, and what's going on there. So... Um, what we have done and what we've shared for folks to position themselves accordingly. You know, we we are big fans of putting our our currency in overfunded whole life insurance contracts, have some gold and silver, some wealth insurance, and then also some exposure as an inflation edge to some cryptocurrencies is a very, very um, good play to position your liquidity. And then there's also strategies um, which we will share in our community of actually how to collateralize all three of these types of money 
uh, and leverage it to purchase eventually assets at a discount. Most folks know that we have got a free video series at yourownbankingsystem.com where we share of how to collateralize an overfunded insurance contract like they do in family offices to purchase assets with it. You could do the same thing with gold and silver and you could do the same thing with cryptocurrencies. Um, like I said, we will in our community share content eventually and courses of how to do that with both gold and silver and with cryptos. There is a massive demand for affordable housing across the United States that far outpaces the current supply. More and more people will be renting in droves and it's putting the squeeze on an already tight rental market. This provides a unique opportunity in a recession resistant and also the highest yielding investment niche in real estate right now, mobile home parks. Four Peaks Capital Partners has been successfully investing in this proven recession resistant sector for years, providing investors with predictable passive income and capital appreciation. Four Peaks Capital Partners offer private real estate investments for accredited investors to passively invest in this real estate niche. To learn more how to protect your investment portfolio and at the same time generate predictable income passively, visit privateincomeinvesting.com. That's privateincomeinvesting.com. So those are some thoughts of how to prepare. So again, make sure... Make sure that if there's a second lockdown that you're prepared for it, you've got food, you've got all the supplies that you need, you've got everything that you're, you and your family need to be able to, to survive. Be prepared for civil unrest around the time of the election or after that. So take care of everything that you need to and have it in place what you need to protect yourself and your family. And then from a from a financial strategy, our strategy is still the same. Um, like I said, these three these three different vehicles to to have exposure to are critical and there's also ways to then collateralize the money in insurance contracts gold and silver and then also cryptocurrencies and leverage that to eventually purchase asset assets at a discount um, there's going to be an incredible incredible opportunity uh, to buy businesses and there already has been there's a lot of folks right now already purchasing businesses um, there was of course a massive group of baby boomers that their retirement plan was to sell their businesses you could still negotiate a a win-win situation for both of you because uh, there's a lot of people that like to sell their businesses now some again be very careful what type of businesses is it? and look at it that if this thing stay the same way for the next five years, what type of businesses do you need to purchase to survive and what will survive and thrive in an environment such as this and sustain itself for the next five years? It's kind of changed the game. It's kind of changed the mindset. Another thing is also, if you have an existing business, you have to find a way to take that business online and take it from brick and mortar and analog to digital. You have to find a way to do that. Um, I'm actually going to do a episode on that where I share ideas of how you can do that. There's gonna be massive opportunities if you can figure out how to do that and do that successfully because you have to be digital in an environment like this. You have to be virtual uh, and the opportunities going from brick and mortar and analog to digital is enormous. Think about it this way, folks. Um, every business that's gone from, from uh, brick and mortar and analog to digital has grown exponentially. It's hockey stick type of uh, growth. Um, every business, because if you think about it, you've removed a lot of, a lot of things that uh, or obstacles to scaling a business out of the way. So think about it this way. If you have a brick and mortar business, you're tied to a geographic area, you have a physical space, which is only so big, so you can only have so many widgets or so many salespeople in a place. Um, there's so many, only so many hours in a day that you can operate in. And now when you take that online and turn it into digital, you've eliminated the geographic restriction. Uh, if you can uh, turn things in, uh, from physical products into information products, 
it's now become limitless of how many of those you, that you can sell and it doesn't require actual physical products being shipped somewhere. Um, you know, examples, Amazon started as a bookstore, right? Started as a bookstore, if you were a bookstore, uh, let's just say a, a mom and pop bookstore in a town, the bookstore is only in that specific town, so you have to have people, you're restricted to people buying books from you in that town and maybe neighboring town. Then you're restri restricted to the amount of books that's in um, inside of that bookstore. Uh, so there, it's tough to scale it, where then Amazon comes and says, you know, we're a online digital bookstore where people all over the world can list their books on and ship it from their home to someone that's that's purchasing it um, so now all of a sudden where the bookstore that's let's just say a mom and pop in a specific town they're only going to keep the books that are moving right the in inventory that's that's sold uh, so there's a limit to their selection Amazon didn't have that problem too because they can list any book under the face of the sun uh, on there if somebody has it and is willing to sell it and would ship it so the the growth was just uh, unbelievable and you could scale it the same with Netflix you know I still remember where you would go into a video store to rent video it's only a certain size there's only a certain amount of videos in there you got to have videos in your video store that people are going to rent and want to rent. So there's a limit to the selection that you have. Here comes Netflix. I remember they, when they still started with, they started with, um, with DVDs that you would go online, you would pick the titles that you want to watch, and they would ship it in an envelope to your mailbox. And then you would watch it and you would put it back in the mailbox and ship it back. That was, that was huge. Take, let's take it up a couple of notches digitally, remove the physical product. Now you can stream on demand from thousands of movie titles that you want to see. So the growth and the scalability is, is, is unbelievable. So that's the opportunity. It's taking a brick and mortar and analog business to a digital business, buying businesses that would survive in this climate if we're going to be stuck in this for the next five years. Uh, prepare yourself for that. Uh, there's a lot of folks looking at buying businesses uh, in specific niches uh, and then bundling them, like a financial services um, and a tax uh, a business, and combining them uh, and maybe an insurance, you know, so financial services, insurance, and then tax, bundling them and then selling them um, to to bigger companies. So there's a lot of ideas like that floating around. Think about your niche and, and, and industries that you know and industries that would survive in this environment and look at the opportunities that are there because there, there are going to be endless opportunities again. Um, the first part of this, of this episode, I wanted to get have clarity to share some ideas and some thoughts and then we also want to provide practical solutions so take care of yourself uh, yourself and your family um, get some all the supplies that you need food uh, get everything that you need to protect your family and then from a financial side position yourself in anti fiats as well as fiats so the anti fiats being gold and silver and then cryptos the fiats being the US dollar and then also Try to take your current business or business or businesses that you acquire from uh, from brick and mortar and analog to digital. Look at other opportunities to purchase businesses. And again, there's already opportunities in real estate. I just mentioned one of them, the resorts and the hospitality space. There's already massive opportunities there for entrepreneurs moving in there. Um, so those are just some ideas at this uh, this time. But again, as the the title of this video suggests prepare for five years, five years of the of the COVID-19 um, and uh, position yourself. And again, by looking at this mountain in front of you saying, oh, my goodness, five years. Are you kidding me? How am I going to build a, a, bus a business that's going to survive in this? When you, the solutions, the raw materials is the challenges, as my coach Dan Sullivan would say, and the solution that you would come up with would um, would create an opportunity of uh, potentially one of the biggest of your life uh, and, and for your business. So that's our show for today. Um, 
please like, subscribe, share our show with other folks. Um, we're going to put more and more content out like this. If you enjoyed this episode and you appreciated the honest feedback and commentary and insights, please let me know too. I'd like to hear from you. Please comment below. Uh, please shoot us an email at info at cashflowninja.com. And for all of our other past episodes, go to cashflowninja.com. There's over 600 episodes there with Cashflow Ninjas. Um, please take a look at that over there as long as, well, rather, as well as a link to my other um, show called Cashflow Investing Secrets, where I share lessons, insights, and ideas that I've learned from interviewing over 600 Cashflow Ninjas. And don't forget to sign up for that webinar at cashflowninja.com forward slash SOTU, S-O-T-U, um, that I'll be hosting on September 1st at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with my friend Dave Stitch, um, a multimillionaire that is currently living in Puerto Rico that I said has he's four for four calling real estate moves uh, over the past uh, past uh, two decades and uh, he spends uh, a lot of money to uh, access the most accurate information and data so that he can make the best possible decisions and also see what's coming and how to position himself. Uh, for it and he sh will be sharing that with us and you get to ask him questions live again i appreciate you until next time live infinitely this presentation is for educational and informational purposes only the information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation and it does not make personalized recommendations this material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives situation and needs we believe the information provided is reliable but we do not